Okay, so CPTSD. CPTSD, as I said, stands for complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people call it um, childhood post-traumatic stress disorder. It's caused by neglect, physical, mental, and emotional abuse, ongoing and repeated trauma from which there's no escape. <clears throat> and it requires a reliance on your abusers. So it's as I said, generally suffered by prisoners of war and children <laughs> who grow up in dysfunctional families. That could be as much as 80% of people because <clears throat> parents are generally going to parent the way they were parented. Um, this kind of trauma is usually generational. So if um, your parents grew up with a dysfunctional family, it's likely they are going to be attracted to um, fellow uh, people who grew up with dysfunctional families, and they're going to create a dysfunctional family for their children. <clears throat> the symptoms of CPTSD include issues with emotional regulation or emotional dysregulation, acting out, which may involve becoming narcissistic and abusive, or acting in. <clears throat> acting in can take the form of self-harm, eating disorders, substance abuse. Food is the most common substance that people use to try and suppress their emotions. So emotional eating is a very common um, form of acting in. <clears throat> you can have a constant feeling of unease. You can have a negative self-image. So <clears throat> you're going to see yourself as a bad object in psychological terms. People with CPTSD often have relationship issues. Relationships are often very short-lived and very intense from the start and short-lived. <clears throat> Dissociation um, so that can mean going somewhere else in your head. Um, flashbacks can be a form of dissociation. <clears throat> you can have a fear of abandonment. Uh, you may be codependent or a people pleaser, be afraid to say no. Um, have a fear of, again, rejection and abandonment. Fear that saying no to people is going to cause them to dislike you. So <clears throat> you become a codependent people pleaser. So how many of those symptoms do you have? Let me know in the chat box. All of them, five. Emotional eating, yeah. All of them. As I said, I can't tell you if you have CPTSD. No one can tell you if you have CPTSD over a Zoom call, um, but <clears throat> I think for a um, psychiatric diagnosis, uh, you'd need to have four or more of those symptoms. Yeah. So, emotional flashbacks. A man called Pete Walker um, wrote a book uh, called CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving. In that book, <coughs> Pete Walker gives his theory on emotional flashbacks. Now, <coughs> this theory, a lot of people uh, say, has been debunked. They say that brain scans show it's actually the thinking part of the brain that is 
activated <clears throat> when someone is having what Pete Walker would class classify as a <clears throat> emotional flashback and not the amygdala, as Pete Walker suggests. But Pete Walker's theory <clears throat> is that emotional flashbacks are an amygdala hijacking. So with standard PTSD, a person has an activating event uh, that could be an explosion or <clears throat> an accident. And then when they experience things that remind them of that event, they flash back to it. So it could be uh, the smell of petrol causes them to flash back to the activating event. Um, <clears throat> with CPTSD, it's different because the trauma was repeated or ongoing. You're going to experience this amygdala hijacking. You're going to move into a 4F response. Again, <clears throat> traditionally, there is the fight, flight, freeze response. Pete Walker um, added a fourth response, which he calls the fawn response. He uses this to explain codependency. He says that when you <clears throat> experience um, something that triggers that emotion, something that causes you to remember um, traumatic events from childhood, you're going to experience an emotional flashback, maybe because the trauma was repeated or you were too young to remember it. You're going to experience the emotion without remembering the actual event. Um, toxic shame. When we grow up with <clears throat> abuse, dysfunction, doesn't have to be extreme abuse, just growing up in an environment where there's a lot of arguing, that's going to cause a child to internalize that dysfunction. It's going to create toxic shame. <clears throat> and they are going to become shamed out of their emotions. So <clears throat> when they um, trigger those emotions, it's going to bring up toxic shame, very bad and negative feelings. We'll be coming more on to toxic shame shortly. <clears throat> so Pete Walker says that emotional flashbacks are often caused by intimacy because they can remind us of how we were abused or neglected as children. Um, <clears throat> again, we're going to talk about good enough parents, but if someone has a good enough parent, um, they're going to be able to process their emotions. Um, they're going to be able to process trauma effectively. And not everyone who experiences a traumatic event develops PTSD. So, <clears throat> again, there is a theory that there is no PTSD without CPTSD. So according to Pete Walker, growing up with dysfunction, experiencing different trauma types at all ages is going to limit our trauma response repertoire and cause us to develop a reliance on specific responses. Pete Walker says people who experience good enough parenting are going to arrive in adulthood with a healthy and flexible response repertoire. They're going to have appropriate access to their all of their 4F choices. <clears throat> so a healthy fight response is going to enable a person to have strong boundaries. They're going to be able to be assertive in healthy ways. They're going to be able to use aggression appropriately. Someone with an unhealthy fight response um, may become narcissistic, abusive, um, they are probably going to have very porous boundaries, so they're going to let things get pushed too far and then have to resort to more severe levels of aggression to try and restore some order. Um, a healthy flight response is going to give the person the ability to know when to walk away. An unhealthy flight response is going to cause a reliance on substances, 
um, <clears throat> emotional eating, etc. Healthy freeze response. We all move into the freeze response before any other uh, trauma response. The freeze response. When we move into the freeze response, our brain releases all kinds of opioids. Um, a healthy freeze response is going to give us the ability to weigh up the situation to conserve energy. An unhealthy freeze response is going to result in dissociation. <clears throat> a very small child, such as a baby, can't fight back, can't run away. Their only option is to go somewhere else in their head. So dissociation becomes a coping strategy to abuse and dysfunction. <clears throat> a healthy fawn response gives us the ability to listen and to compromise. An unhealthy fawn response causes us to serve others, to people please, to be afraid to say no. So from what I've discussed there, what would you say your trauma types are? Are you more of a fight freeze or a fawn freeze? Do you have more reliance on one of those trauma types than the others? Let me know in the chat box. Yeah. So Ford. Excellent. Okay, so Many people relying on, on the fawn response. Pete Walker says that freeze fawn are going to be the most vulnerable to um, finding themselves in abusive relationships and toxic situations. So <clears throat> intimacy can cause strong emotional flashbacks because it can cause us to remember how we were abused or neglected as children. The fight, flight, freeze or fawn response can become triggered to, present, to prevent us re-experiencing the trauma we suffered as children. We can avoid making ourselves vulnerable so we don't risk being attacked or abandoned. So how does childhood cause CPTSD? Until the age of seven is known as the imprint period. It's in this age range that your neuroplasticity is at its highest. It's when you're learning the most complex and difficult tasks. <clears throat> you're going to see um, the people around you, the adults around you, as you know, authority figures, you're going to take what they're telling you as the truth. Um, you're going to be looking to them to learn about yourself, <clears throat> to learn about how you should relate to yourself. And the most important relationship for any child is the relationship with the mother. The relationship with the mother <clears throat> forms the foundation for all future relationships, including your relationship with yourself. So if you have a bad relationship with your mother, you're going to be in trouble growing up, trying to form relationships with others. Um, so when we are in the womb, we're going to pick up on everything the mother feels. So if the mother feels 
anxious or depressed, the baby is going to be anxious and depressed. And babies, <coughs> human babies, are born without fully developed brains. Um, if you, you know, look at a horse or I don't know, a camel or something. Um, as soon as they're born, they're able to walk and move around. Human babies, it takes like, I don't know, 15 to 18 months before a human baby can start to walk. This is because if you were born with a fully developed brain, uh, your mother would have a lot of trouble trying to um, get you out. So your brain develops... Um, up until at the age of five, 90% of your brain um, developed before the age of five. So, as I said, that is when your neuroplasticity is at its highest. The things that you learn in your childhood, they are going to affect the whole of your life. So, if you're um, learning, if you're growing up in a dysfunctional environment, that's going to have a knock-on effect into your career, into your relationships, etc. So negative self-talk. <clears throat> negative self-talk is very common uh, for people that grow up with dysfunction. Again, because your neuroplasticity is so high when you're a child because you're looking to your parents to help you understand the world, understand yourself. Um, you're going to be very susceptible to developing negative self-talk um, if you grow up in a dysfunctional environment. Negative self-talk isn't in a dialogue that you have with yourself. It's an inner critic, a hijacked superego, or an internalized abuser. It can keep you stuck in a negative stuck cycle, call you all kinds of names, cause you to feel anxious, tell you you're useless or worthless. If someone compliments you, you can think, ah, oh, they're lying. You know, that's not true. Um, it can cause you to be codependent, a people pleaser, a doormat. Again, it can cause you to develop that fear of abandonment, rejection, feel like you're not worthy of good treatment. If anyone treats you well, you can even react very badly to that. It can cause you to have a lack of boundaries. <clears throat> it's a negative inner voice that's going to keep you stuck in abusive relationships, making you think you deserve to be treated badly, telling you there's something wrong with you, making you think you can't get any better, that you won't survive on your own, etc. Does anyone have any questions with regards to anything I have covered there? Okay, fabulous. So the different types of negative self-talk, you can have perfectionism. If you try to be perfect, you'll never be good enough. And perfectionism can become a family role. When we grow up without good enough parents, we're going to be forced to take on family roles. Family roles are designated to the child by all of the family members, not just uh, the parents. One of those family roles could be to be a perfectionist, the super achiever, to, you know, do everything perfectly. And again, that's going to be a, a fawn response. That's going to be a people-pleasing response, being perfect for your parents, so you don't get criticized or abused. 
uh, all or nothing thinking. Um, so if something goes wrong, you tell yourself everything always goes wrong. I'll always fail. There's no in between. Usually, <clears throat> if things go right, you'll just discount them as luck or, you know, something and just focus on the negative, telling yourself, I'll always fail. Nothing ever goes right for me, etc. Pessimism, always worrying about the worst case scenario, always looking for things that can go wrong. Again, if you're a child and you're growing up in a dysfunctional environment, you maybe need to learn to worry in order to survive that environment. Maybe need to always look for things to go that to go wrong to, you know, survive things going wrong. Um, if you've got a parent who's unreliable, who tells you they're going to do things and then they don't do them, uh, that can cause you to, you know, always look for things to go wrong. <clears throat> Name calling, calling yourself names. Um, can also involve projecting negativity onto others, gossiping about other people, putting other people down to try and elevate yourself, or projecting past experiences onto others. So thinking, you know, again, everyone's going to abandon you, uh, thinking everyone is out to get us or harm us, like the world is a dangerous or difficult place. So <clears throat> comparing yourself to others is a very common form of negative self-talk, uh, especially in today's society. Most people compare themselves to other people um, because of social media, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram. We see people posting uh, the best things that they've got going on in their lives, even on Instagram, Photoshop, pictures, etc. So we may look at people on social media, maybe people we know, people we don't know, and see that they are doing better than we perceive ourselves to be doing. Uh, maybe seeing that they've got a better car than us or a better <laughs> job than us. If we do this, we're not being fair to ourselves because we don't know um, what's going on in their lives. We only see the things that they want to show us. And as I said, a lot of those things could even be staged or photoshopped. Um, <clears throat> so by judging ourselves by what we see others doing, we're not being fair to ourselves because we can see everything we've got going on in our own lives. We can only see snapshots of what are going on in theirs. We don't really know if they're happy in their lives, in their marriage or their job or any of that. So comparing yourself to others, um, very negative thing to do. If you grow up with this function, as I said, relationships are often going to be very short-lived um, and very intense from the start. Intense from the start and short-lived would be a better way around of putting that. Um, <clears throat> there's a phenomenon known as attractions of deprivation, which says we are going to be most attracted to people that will traumatize us. Attractions of deprivation are caused by traumatic experiences in childhood. And everyone experiences, in ch experiences trauma in childhood to some degree. Um, if you're three years old, losing your mum in the supermarket could be a life-threatening event. Um, also, we can um, compare, you know, other people's trauma to our own trauma and think, you know, they have experienced much worse than me. Other people have experienced much worse than me. Discount our own 
trauma. Um, <coughs> what's traumatic for one person is traumatic for everyone. So just because your trauma may not be as severe as someone else's doesn't mean it's not traumatic. Likewise, this kind of inner child work, <coughs> it's not about blaming our parents. As I said, everyone is doing the best they can with what they have. Uh, most parents are going to parent the way they were parented. So it's not about blaming others. It's not about having a victim mentality. It's not also <coughs> not about discrediting our own experiences. Um, anyway, going back to attractions of deprivation, uh, we're going to be most drawn to people that embody the worst emotional characteristics of our primary caregivers. Sigmund Freud famously said that all men are going to be attracted to women like their mother and all women <coughs> are going to be attracted to men like their father. This isn't true. It could be either parent. So, um, you know, whichever parent causes you the most emotional damage, um, those are the wounds that you're going to be trying to heal through your intimate relationships. Even though you may be an adult, you're going to be trying to heal those unresolved childhood hurts that it could be caused due to betrayal, manipulation, abuse and neglect from your caregivers. And <clears throat> unconsciously, you're going to seek out the healing of these wounds in your intimate relationships. You're going to seek out people that will irritate these wounds so that you can heal them. You're going to be making unconscious contracts with people who complement your family system. <clears throat> so that is attractions of deprivation. Another theory is that we are looking to our parents to model for us what people, how people should treat each other, how, what relationships should look like. Um, and if we're growing up witnessing this function, we are going to learn that this function is how you interact with people. We're going to be interacting with people in dysfunctional ways. And we're going to find ourselves feeling most comfortable uh, with people who interact with us the way that we are, we've learned to interact with people. Um, <clears throat> we're also, as I said previously, the relationship with the mother or mothering person to be politically correct, is the most important relationship for any child. It's going to underpin all future relationships. If you've learned um, from your mothering person, if you've learned from your parents that, you know, you should be treated badly, you're going to find yourself being comfortable with people that treat you badly. So does anyone have any questions? with regards to any of that let me know in the chat box Yeah, negative self-talk, <clears throat> it can come from spending a long time in an abusive relationship as an adult. If you are in a relationship where you're constantly being attacked, put down, called names, you're going to internalize it and it's going to create that negative self-talk. You're going to be <clears throat> most susceptible to it as a child because... Your neuroplasticity is so high because you're looking to the adults around you to help you understand the world, help you 
understand yourself. Can deep breathing be a remedy to making you feel better? Um, yeah, it can. And we're going to look at uh, breathing techniques and things shortly. Um, <clears throat> when a person experiences trauma, I spoke about uh, the emotional flashbacks. Um, <clears throat> but when a person experiences trauma, the emotional part of their brain actually increases in size and the thinking part of the brain decreases in size, making them more prone to emotional dysregulation. So having a regular relaxation exercise um, can actually start to shrink the size of your amygdala, increase the, the size of your the thinking part of your brain, making you less prone to emotional dysregulation. So what did we need <clears throat> as children? So I spoke about how we need good enough parents. What is a good enough parent? So for healthy psychosocial development, the child needs good enough parents. A good enough parent is going to provide unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. So the child's going to know that they're loved and accepted no matter what. Even if they are naughty, um, they're still going to know that their parent loves and accepts them. Uh, they're going to be patient and they're going to be dependable. So as I said, <clears throat> an undependable parent can cause um, can cause counter-dependency, which is the complete opposite of codependency. It can cause you to not want to ask other people for help, to um, be afraid of intimacy, be afraid to um, get attached to anyone for fear that they'll let you down. Um, <clears throat> a good enough parent is going to have their own sense of individuality and they're going to have an internal locus of control. Some parents um, blame their children for being born, tell them that they were a mistake, that they ruined their lives, etc. These aren't good enough parents. So what else do you think a good enough parent will have? Let me know in the chat box. Yeah. Do children need both parents? <clears throat> um, there's research that suggests the child only needs one good enough parent. Um, there's other research that suggests children need both parents. Um, depends. Depends on what research you look at. Generally, a child is going to need a mother to make them feel loved and accepted. They're going to need 
a father to help them feel safe and protected, to help them learn how to interact socially. Um, so, as I said, it depends on whose opinion you listen to. <clears throat> so, the relationship with the mother or the mothering person is the most important relationship for any child. You're going to need a mothering person who is emotionally regulated, safe and reliable. And it, as I said, it's going to form the foundation for all future relationships, including your relationship with yourself. Um, and until 15 months to three years, you were a we before you became an I. It's not until you start to be able to move around, to um, put your fingers in plug sockets and things, that you start to get a sense of self. Um, before that, you see everything as you pushed out. And <clears throat> until you start to get that sense of self, you can't regulate your own emotions. A baby is looking to their parents to help them regulate their emotions. If you ever try to comfort a baby who's crying um, and that's caused you to become anxious or upset, you'll notice that adds to the baby's dysregulation because they're picking up on what you're feeling. So a dysregulated parent is going to add to the baby's dysregulation, um, a well-regulated parent is going to be able to regulate the baby to <coughs> help them um, develop healthy emotions. So if you want to heal these things, if you want to um, overcome uh, the things caused by a dysfunctional childhood, you need to be a good enough parent to yourself. Um, and to become a good enough parent to yourself, as I said, you need a regular relaxation practice. Um, and there's some breathing exercises I will share with you now. The first exercise I'm going to share with you is called box breathing. Box breathing involves breathing in for a set number. Um, that could be, well, <clears throat> for tonight's uh, demonstration, we're going to use the number five. So you're going to breathe in for the count of five. You're going to hold your breath for the count of five. Breathe out for the count of five and hold the space between breaths for the count of five. When you breathe in, you want to breathe all the way down into your stomach. And just taking some deep breaths to start with. Breathing in through your nose, all the way down into your stomach. Breathing out with a sigh. If you uh, make the conscious effort to breathe into your stomach as much as possible, you're going to notice yourself feeling more calmer more relaxed throughout the day. Um, it's said that until we start school, children naturally breathe into their stomachs, but for some reason, uh, when we start school, we lose the ability to do this. We start breathing <coughs> more shallowly into our chests. Um, breathing into your chest is causes your body to release all kinds of stress hormones and things. So breathing into your stomach making the conscious effort to do that, you're going to notice more relaxation in your life. So box breathing. <laughs> anyway, um, taking a deep breath in all the way down into your stomach, breathing in for the count of five, holding your breath for the count of five, breathing out for the count of five, and then holding the space between breaths 
for the count five. So your breathing takes the shape of a box. If you'd like to try a few rounds of that on your own now, breathing in for five, holding your breath for five, breathing out for five, holding the space between breaths for five. And if you have trouble with lung capacity, you can reduce that number down. Um, <clears throat> if you have very good lungs, if you're a free diver or something, you can make that number bigger. You can even see how big you can make that number, how big you can make that box if you want. The next exercise I'm going to show you is called 7-11 breathing. 7-11 breathing involves breathing in for the count of 7, breathing out for the count of 11. And the theory is that by elongating the out breath, you're going to trigger the relaxation response. Because if you were in a life or death situation, you wouldn't be breathing out for longer than you were breathing in. So by breathing out for longer than you're breathing in, you're telling your mind that the information your senses are taking in says it's safe. So if you'd like to try that now, breathing in for the count of seven, and then breathing out for the count of 11. So you can also write letters to your inner child. You can write letters from your inner child to your adult self. See if you can get hold of a picture of yourself as a child. Put it in your purse or wallet or put it on your fridge, somewhere where you're going to see it regularly. Have a regular relaxation practice. As I said, the more... You take time to relax, the easier it's going to become to relax. The more you'll start to really regulate um, your limbic system, uh, your amygdala, the more um, mindful you'll be able to become. Um, you can also reconnect with your emotions through journaling. Um, and there is, um, if you... Google emotion will, <clears throat> you're going to bring up a big chart of emotions. In the center of that chart are going to be your core emotions, happy, sad, angry, anxious. Um, branching out from that are going to be <clears throat> um, more specific feelings within those emotions. Uh, so for anxious, could be uh, fearful, scared, um, for anger, could be rage. <clears throat> Set an alarm on your phone to go off four or five times a day. When that alarm sounds, check in with yourself. Ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? Um, scale the feeling on a scale of one to 10, one being not too bad, 10 being, you know, terrible, off the charts, I can't bear anymore. Um, <clears throat> ask yourself what caused the feeling? Um, what evidence is there to support the feeling? What increases the feeling? What reduces the feeling? Um, and the more you do this, the more you'll notice yourself getting in touch with your emotions. No emotions are either good or bad. They just are. They're there to serve a purpose, to help you in your life. Anxiety um, is part. When a person experiences anxiety, they're moving in to that fight or flight response. And the symptoms of anxiety, such as the sweating, the increased breathing, um, 
the blood pumping around your body, that would be very useful in a life or death situation. The same with anger. Anger is designed to get you out of danger, to enable you to protect your boundaries. <clears throat> Depressed feelings can let you know that you need to make some changes in your life. Um, there would be something wrong with you if you never felt these things. These things are there to serve a purpose. And what resists not only persists, but becomes stronger. So the more you try and fight against the feeling or an emotion or a negative thought, <coughs> the stronger that thing's going to become. The more energy, the more attention you're giving that thing, uh, the more stronger it's going to become. So you want to reconnect with your emotions. Ask yourself, what is this emotion trying to do for me? Um, is it relevant right now? Is there an immediate threat? Of course, if there is an immediate threat, <clears throat> you need to take steps to get out of that situation. But if there isn't, don't try and fight the feeling. Just allow it to be. Um, so starting on Sunday, I have the four-week inner child program. As I said, it's a group program, consists of four group sessions. All the sessions are recorded. Um, <clears throat> so if you miss a session, you can download the recordings and watch them back. Some people like to download the recordings and watch them back at a later date. There's a Facebook group where I've put lots of content to help with emotional eating, negative self-talk, inner child healing. Um, you can find... <clears throat> the recordings for all of my workshops in that group. Um, there's also weekly exercises, which are going to involve um, the letter writing and things that I already spoke about. We're looking to integrate all ages of the inner child from infant to adolescent. So every week um, is for a different age range of the inner child at the end of every week we have a hypnosis session to visualize uh, connecting with and integrating the inner child doing this kind of work can reduce anxiety it can increase self-esteem increase confidence allow you to control your impulses and reconnect with your emotions and as i said <clears throat> All emotions serve a purpose. What resists not only persists, but becomes stronger. Don't try and fight against your emotions or negative thoughts. Just ask yourself <clears throat> what they're trying to tell you, if they're relevant, and let them be. Uh, some feedback from people that have previously done the program. You can find more feedback on my website via the second link I'm about to post in the chat box. <clears throat> okay, the second link I've posted in the chat box, you can find out more about the Inner Child Programme. Um, the Inner Child Programme is currently listed on my website for 225 pounds. <coughs> um, if you'd like to receive a special uh, discount on the program, uh, book a free call with me via the first link. Uh, you can book a free call with me to find out about one-to-one -one therapy. Um, <coughs> I'd recommend people book a call with me, uh, even if you don't want a special price on the Inner Child Programme um, because that way we can make sure that the program's right for you, make sure that you're going to get what you're looking for from the program. So uh, book that call with me regardless. So more feedback. As I said, the second link in the chat box, you can read uh, lots of feedback there. So now we come to shame. I spoke a little bit about 
toxic shame. I spoke a little bit about um, how parents are going to parent the way they were parented. Um, all abuse is the transfer of shame. Everyone is doing the best they can with what they have. Shame as a healthy human emotion can be transformed into a state of being. Shame takes over one's whole identity, according to John Bradshaw. So <clears throat> shame, just like the other emotions, it serves a purpose. Um, it enables us to function in society, lets us know when we need help. Toxic shame <coughs> is different. Toxic shame happens when we internalize abuse, abandonment. Again, it doesn't have to be extreme abuse or dysfunction. Just growing up in an environment where there's a lot of arguing, child's going to internalize that. They're going to think it means there's something wrong with them. It's going to create toxic shame. Uh, if a parent or teacher <coughs> criticizes a child as opposed to their behavior, that's going to create toxic shame. So if a child is, uh, if they make a mess, telling them they're a messy child, as opposed to saying, look at the mess you made. If they're struggling to understand something, telling them they're thick or stupid, that's going to create toxic shame. So toxic shame can cause us to develop a sense of not belonging, never fitting in. <clears throat> When a person takes on toxic shame, happiness is no longer on the inside. So they need to look outside of themselves for happiness. Um, and a child is going to learn to validate themselves from the way that their parents validate them. So if they aren't receiving validation from their parents or if they're receiving invalidation from their parents, they're going to have... <coughs> lots of problems validating themselves as adults. Good feelings can no longer be generated from within, so we may become codependent, uh, we may develop compulsive behaviours and addictions. So who wants to try some hypnosis? Let me know in the chat box if you're ready for some hypnosis. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> so hypnosis isn't something I do to you. It's something I do with you. Hypnosis is a perfectly natural state that we all experience several times during the course of a day. If you've ever driven somewhere, <clears throat> got onto your destination, not remembered the journey, that would be an example of hypnosis. If you've been watching TV, zoned out, lost track of time, that would be an example of hypnosis. It's not something I do to you, it's something I do with you. Um, the benefits of hypnosis. First of all, <clears throat> hypnosis can be a very relaxing state. Um, and as I said, the more a person takes time to relax, the easier it becomes to relax. Um, also, hypnosis can improve your ability to visualize. Um, by visualizing yourself <clears throat> the way you want to be, you actually create new neural pathways in your brain. Your mind can't tell the difference between a real or an imagined event. So the more you visualize yourself the way you want to be, the stronger those neural pathways are going to become, the more you're going to be able to become that person. So <clears throat> to prove this to you, 
we're going to do a couple of exercises. So what I'd like you to do for the first exercise, I'd like you to hold your hands out in front of you, like so. Turn your left hand with your palm facing um, up. Keep your right hand with your palm facing down. Keep your arms straight as I'm showing you on the screen right now. Take a deep breath in. <sighs> Breathe out with a big sigh. Allow your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'd like you to just imagine, only imagine, that in your left hand, we've placed some heavy books, some heavy books are weighing down on that left hand. To your right hand, we've tied some helium balloons, and those helium balloons are rising up, taking that right hand with them. So your left hand sinking lower as your right hand is rising up. Sometimes when we do this exercise, people tell me that they can feel their left arm becoming heavy and tired, and so it's really holding those heavy books, sinking lower and lower as your right hand rises up. That's uh, right. Don't try to resist or assist it in any way. And then leaving those hands where they are, <clears throat> open your eyes and see if you can notice the difference between those hands. If you notice a difference between those hands, let me know in the chat box. Excellent. Fantastic. <clears throat> so another exercise. Again, taking a deep breath in. Breathing out with a big sigh, allowing your eyes to close. And with your eyes closed, I'd like you to just imagine, only imagine, that you're walking into your kitchen. There on the side in your kitchen is a nice bowl of juicy citrus fruits. Maybe you can imagine oranges or lemons. Some people like limes. Others like grapefruits. Whatever kind of citrus fruits you like. I'd like you to just imagine there's a nice juicy bowl of them in your kitchen right now. And what we're going to do in just a moment, we're going to pick up one of those fruits. We're going to place it safely and securely on a cutting board. We're going to safely and securely take a knife. We're going to cut into that fruit. So doing that now, just imagine reaching out a hand, picking up one of those fruits. Maybe you can even get a sense of the weight of that fruit in your hand as you place it down on a cutting board. And then safely and securely taking a knife, cutting into that fruit. Those juices are squirting out. Those citrusy smells are filling the air. And a puddle of juice is forming underneath that fruit on that cutting board. Just imagine that now. And then cutting into that fruit again. So we're creating that nice bite-sized wedge. Again, <clears throat> those juices are squirting out, those citrusy smells are filling the air. That puddle of juice is getting larger and larger on that cutting board. Now we've got this nice wedge of fruit. I'd like to just imagine picking up that wedge of fruit, maybe shaking off any excess juices, lifting it up towards your face, smelling those citrusy smells, placing it in your mouth and biting down. As you're biting down on that fruit, those citrusy flavors are exploding in your mouth, tingling your taste buds. The juices are running out, they're running down your face, dripping off your chin. Just imagine that now. And then when you're ready, you can open your eyes. <clears throat> and if that exercise made your mouth water, let me know in the chat box.
Excellent. So this is the power of visualization. Your mind can't tell the difference between a real or an imagined event. 